Good morning. Good morning again. We welcome everyone this morning. Um, we appreciate everyone's presence. Uh, we had a good uh, Bible study this morning. If you weren't able to make it for that, I encourage you uh, to take advantage of that in the future. We meet at 9.45 in the mornings on Sunday for Bible study and, um, and then obviously 10.30 now for worship. Uh, for the visitors we have with us, we very much appreciate you coming our way as well. Um, we want you to know that our goal this morning is wholeheartedly to worship God in the way that he would like to be worshipped. And we, uh, we hope that we're doing that. If you have any questions or any doubt about that, please let us know. You'd be our friend to let us know. But we'll start this morning with two songs before uh, an opening prayer, a third song, uh, which we'll stand for the opening prayer, and then we'll have a third song before uh, Brother Nathan comes forward for the lesson. Uh, we'll start with song number 43, God is the Fountain Winds. Number 43. <laughs> Song of week, song number forty seven. God is so good. Song number forty seven. stand for the opening prayer. Bow with me, please. All powerful Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning as a group of your saints and others that strive to gather together here and study your will 
and to worship you this morning. We thank you so much for your love, your kindness, your mercy. We acknowledge your high and holy power as you are the creator of all things in and around this earth. And you provide us everything that we need in this life and beyond. For you give us the earth to live upon, the air to breathe, our sustenance. You created us and you created our very souls. And we thank you for all that you've done for us in both the physical and the spiritual realms. We thank you so much for this free country that we live in, that we have an opportunity to not only worship unencumbered by the, the powers to be in this world, yet we recognize there are others throughout this world who do not enjoy such privileges, and we hope and pray for them that they might have what they need and the opportunities might be found to do your will as they strive also to worship you on this first day of the week. We thank you for the blessings that we receive, not only of a physical nature, but the spiritual nature that comes to us as we look to Jesus, the provider of our faith that encourages us as he is also the one that provided the blood that was shed on our behalf that our souls might be washed clean from the sin that separates us so far from you and your grace. And we thank you for your plan of salvation that allowed this to take place as it was given in our place some 2,000 years ago and will continue as long as this world is in existence that we might strive to adhere to your will, recognizing that as we have a repentant attitude towards sin in our life that we would understand that you would hold those sins against us no longer. Help us to share those truths with others around us who are not yet in your grace. We hope and pray that we do our part as we are commissioned to go forth into the world to spread the gospel to the lost and dying around us. We give, we, we give you thanks for the opportunity to do that and hope and pray as, as we walk through this life that we would have the proper attitude that would compel us to share those gospel truths with others. Help us as we live this life to have a poor spirit that allows our heart to be focused on what's truly important in your sight, as what comes naturally is not always in accordance with your will. But we can develop understanding and wisdom in our lives through, through your word. And as we study from it this morning, we hope and pray that everyone here would gain a bit of knowledge compared to what they had when they came in those doors. Hope, uh, hope that you would be guiding us through this worship service, help us have the proper attitude as we initially and <coughs> completely want to praise your name this morning, that we might be success, successful in all our efforts as we pray, sing songs, and remember your son's sacrifice on the cross as we partake of the emblems. Help us through all these activities that your praise and your glory might be honored to all who are here. Watch over our lives, Father, in the days to come. Help us to have a good week as we fortify our spirits this morning. Help us to keep in our mind all that you've done for us, which is great. And seize the opportunities as they come our way. Is our prayer in Christ's holy name. Amen. As we've sung this morning, we've sung how God is the fountain of winds, how he blesses us. We've sung that he, about the comfort he affords. We've sung God is so good, that Jesus is real, that he saves my soul. And it's because of these things we can sing song number 63, sing and be happy. No matter what happens, the skies are gray, we can sing and be happy. I welcome you all to please sing out with me as we sing song 683. Be right. 
what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? If you knew you could not fail, what would you do? It's a question that we'll seek to answer this morning. If you have your Bibles, be be turning with me to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, we'll begin there. This morning we're going to be looking at the lives of two people, two women who had a major impact on those around them. Two women who empowered themselves to a future that, that they could not predict. It is so good to be here this morning. The blessing of creation that surrounds us. A beautiful day. The presence of each and every one of you, it's certainly an encouragement to me that you are here. Thank you for being here. We can read in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 1 that Moses is dead. Their leader, the man who led them out of Egypt, out of the wilderness, he's gone. There's a new leader, Joshua, who's going to lead them into the promised land. And God gives very specific commands to Joshua. You look at Joshua chapter 1 and verse 6, be strong and courageous. And he doesn't say that just once. Verse 9, have I not commanded you, God says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. Dismayed, For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And the first place that they go after they cross the Jordan River is the city of Jericho. And this is where we meet our first character. Her name is Rahab. There in Joshua chapter 2, we skip some verses for the sake of time, but Joshua chapter 2 and verse 1, And Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid on the ro- in order on the roof. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death, if you do not tell this business of ours. Then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. And the two men return in verse 23. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they told him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. We have a woman who hides these two men, two spies from the nation of Israel. And it's not just any woman. She's a prostitute. And we have in our minds the kind of things that that word provides. These men stay with her. They are not there to spend time with Rahab. They are there to spy out the city. In verse 8 through 14, they are key passages for Rahab. 
see her faith. See her belief. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. You see her trust in God. This is not a God that she had ever sacrificed animals to. This is not a God that she had ever worshipped. This is not a God who led her out of Egypt and out of the wilderness. This is not her God. But yet, because of the things that she heard, she didn't see, she didn't witness these things. She heard about them. And because of that, she's willing to risk her life and her family's life to hide these spies to save her family from the destruction of Jericho. In Joshua chapter 6, we read the end of the story. Joshua chapter 6, we can read about how Jericho was shut. No one was going in and no one was going out. God commands the nation of Israel to march around the city once for six days. And on the seventh day, they march around seven times. They shout and they blow their horns and the walls, they come tumbling down. The Israelites are victorious over the city walls of Jericho by not even raising a weapon. The end of the city. But it's the beginning of the story of Rahab. Joshua chapter 6, starting there in verse 22. But to, to the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, Go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belonged to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies, went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and everything in it. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Jericho ends here. But the story of Rahab, it begins. Let's fast forward in history to the book of Ruth. To the book of Ruth. If your Bible is like mine, on the back side of where Ruth begins, Judges ends. In Judges chapter 21 and verse 25, it says this. This is the very last verse. In those days, there was no king in Israel. This is the context of the book of Ruth. There's no king, and I'm going to do what I want. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. This is the setting for the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1 and verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. We can read about this man named Elimelech and his wife Naomi. They have two sons. But they go to a foreign country because of a severe Famine. They're looking for food. And they marry two Moabite women, their sons, one named Orpah and another named Ruth. The husband to Naomi dies, Elimelech dies, the two sons die, so it's three women left without their husbands. And Naomi is left with her two daughters in law. This is the context of Ruth chapter 1. Verses 6 through 18. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord has visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, 
as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, And they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? And she pleads with her two daughters-in-law in in verses 12 and 13. She pleads with them, Go, go back. Verse 14, Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clung to her. She said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. The famine is over. It's time to go home, she says. Orpah does, after much pleading, but Ruth stays. Ruth would eventually meet Boaz. Boaz is a relative of Elimelech. And Naomi sees an opening. She has Ruth and Boaz married. We can read about that in Ruth 2 and 3 and 4. But do you see the faith of Ruth? Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Where you die, I'm going to die. You see her faith. You see her belief. You see her trust. The end of the book, Ruth chapter 4, is the end of the sorrow for Naomi. And it's the beginning of the story and the joy of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. He went into her, and the Lord gave her conception. She bore a son. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. This was not the end of a, just another Moabite woman. This is the beginning of the story of a foreigner named Ruth. And this is where their story takes a turn to the New Testament. What do you think would be the fate of a prostitute and a foreigner? What would be their fate in the nation of Israel? We don't have to guess one bit. That answer lies in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon. And Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David, the king. The genealogy of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. His lineage includes a prostitute and a foreigner. What I want to do with you this morning is to show you responsibility and opportunity from these two women, the lessons that we can learn. To start, Rahab and Ruth felt responsible 
to their family. These two women felt responsible to those around them. Rahab was not only looking out for her family, her father and her mother and her siblings and their children. She was looking out for those two spies. She gave them shelter and care. Ruth felt responsible to her mother-in-law, Naomi. She was going to stay by her side no matter what. But it goes beyond that. It goes beyond a feeling of responsibility. Because Rahab and Ruth were presented an opportunity to act. Yes, Rahab and Ruth had a feeling, but they had an opportunity to act on that feeling. They stepped up. They took action. They made hard decisions. They took risk. They felt hardship and loss, of course, but there was opportunity to do something. Something that would show their strength. Something that would show their, their loyalty. Something that would show their commitment. Their responsibility and their opportunity led them to this last point. God turned seemingly insignificant women into significant women. Their choices and their actions led them both to the genealogy of our Lord and Savior. Rahab was a prostitute. Ruth was a foreigner. They were not Jews. They were not part of the chosen race of God. But yet God used their decisions to turn them into marvelous women. In the eyes of the world, they were low. They were scraping the bottom of the barrel. They were insignificant. Because of their choices, lives were saved and lives were changed. What are we to do with this responsibility? What are we to do with this opportunity? Number one, each of us has a responsibility to our God. There is an obligation to the God who created us. He made us. Our responsibility is to Him. But we don't act that way. We, we would rather feel responsible to ourselves and fulfill our own desires. It is much easier for me to sit on the throne of my own heart. Where is our responsibility supposed to be? Let's ask the men who received the talents in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, starting there in verse 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more, he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The five-talent man, his master is pleased with him. The master is pleased with the two-talent man. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. But to the one talent man, he says, you wicked and slothful servant. Cast the worthless servant into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The servant was lazy. He was not responsible. He took the throne of his own life and acted in the way that he wanted to act. And now he is considered worthless. What do you think would have happened to Rahab if on the night that the two spies came to her, she wanted to act the way that she wanted to? We don't have to guess. She would have died. And her family would have died. 
because God would have still destroyed the city anyway. The servant's responsibility is to his master. Rahab's responsibility was to God. Our responsibility is to God. Number two, each one of us has a responsibility to Christ's church. There is a responsibility to our Father, and there is a responsibility to the church that Christ died for. This is a long passage of Scripture. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Instead of me commenting on it and briefly describing, we're just going to let the inspiration of God speak for itself. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting there in verse number 12. It says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. And all, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Each one here is a part of the body of the church of Christ. If you have been baptized, you are a member of the church of Christ, a single member of a larger body. And what is your responsibility as a member of this body? Paul would make the analogy that it's no different than a physical body. Our bodies have many members that work together. You would not call your lungs the things that you use to breathe in and out your big toe. Why? Because they don't serve the same function. You don't call your ears and your eyes. Why? Because they do not serve the same function. Yet each member works together. Each member is responsible to the body. So what does that mean as members of this church? What does that mean for me as a smaller member of a larger body? It means that if I'm the heart... I'm going to pump blood as best as I can, as efficiently as I can. If I'm the nose, I'm going to smell as best as I can. If I'm the pinky toe, I'm going to wiggle as best as I can. Each member matters. Each member matters. And if you don't believe me, read again 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And verse 22, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. 
Notice that the scripture doesn't say that they are weaker. It says that they seem to be weaker. So let me ask you, who's doing the judging? Who's doing the judging here? I would argue that it's a member of a body who's judging another member of the body to be weaker. The scripture doesn't say that you are weak. It says that they seem to be weaker. But you are indispensable. Ruth was a foreigner outside of the Jewish family. She may have been seemingly weak, but did she matter? Did Ruth matter? The answer is a resounding yes, she did. Just the same, we have a responsibility to the body, the church that Christ died for. Number three, each of us has an opportunity to act. If we are responsible to our Father, to our God, our Creator, and we are responsible to Christ, the man who died for us, for this church. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about that responsibility? Part of that answer lies, I believe, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Verse 12, to equip the saints, that's me, that's you, for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith. The body working together to attain unity. Verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. From the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. My actions, your actions, should be to attain the unity of the faith. So that we can grow together. We can be strong together. The goal of this body is not to pick a single person or a group of people and elevate them high above all others. The goal of this body, our purpose, is to work together to attain the unity of the faith. Our job, our obligation, is to make the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is what I need to do. How do I do that? Could I suggest to you this morning that in order for the body to grow, that we need to worship together. We need to sing songs of praise together. We need to pray together. We need to study together. We need to commune together. If there was ever a verse that a preacher could burn a hole right through the page, it would be this. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. But we miss the context sometimes of verse 24. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let us consider something. How can I stir up love and good works to you? How can you stir up love and good works to me?
let's say we didn't meet ever at this building. This building didn't exist. But yet there's 200 members of a church of Christ. Does it make sense for me to drive to your house and 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 you drive to my house, each other person sitting in this room? How can I consider how to stir up love and good works to the body of Christ? How about we meet together at a certain time? That's 9.45 on Sundays for Bible class, 10.30 for worship, 6 p.m. Sunday nights, 7 p.m. Wednesday nights. That is a way for the members of the body to come together. All the parts coming together for a single purpose, to attain the unity of the faith. Responsibility is in verse 24. My responsibility to you is to stir up love and good works in you. Is this world hard to love? Is it hard to do good works in this world? You bet it is. My opportunity is in verse 25. To meet together. To come together. To worship together. Responsibility and opportunity. Over the course of the next few months, there is going to be an opportunity to step up as individual members of this body. Each of us has a responsibility, but have you been acting on the opportunity? If you feel like you are insignificant in this church, listen to God's word when he says, you are not insignificant. Rahab was a prostitute. Ruth was a foreigner. But God made them significant because God saw their actions. He saw their faith. He saw their trust. And it changed their future. You have an opportunity to impact the future of this church maybe now more than ever in the history of Laurel Canyon. You could have an impact on the future of this church. You have a responsibility not to our elders, not to our deacons. They will not be standing next to you on the day of judgment. You have a responsibility to our God and a responsibility to Christ and His church. And you have a great opportunity to serve. Will you do that this morning? Will you be like Rahab? Will you be like Ruth? At the bottom of your bulletin, there's a box that says, I have a responsibility to my God and the body of Christ. Therefore, I will make the most of my opportunity to serve other members by. You fill that in. What will you write? How will you serve another member here? Worship service is not the only time to do that. There are opportunities to serve outside of these walls. At the very least, if you're looking for the bare minimum here and follow up on it, write down one word, and that's pray. Pray for this church. Pray for our elders. Pray for our deacons. Pray for Jason. Pray for wisdom as we select our next preacher. It could have a major impact on the future of this church. Let's go back to our very first question. What would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? 
Do you think failure was on the mind of Rahab? If there was, it wasn't recorded. Does Ruth have failure on her mind? If there was, we don't see it. If we knew we couldn't fail, would we serve God or would you serve yourself? Rahab and Ruth knew they couldn't fail with God on their side, and neither will we. We will not fail with God. So why not choose to serve His church? Take this opportunity and challenge yourself in serving the church of Christ. How many of us will do something hard and challenge ourselves at work or at school? I would venture to say every one of us is going to raise our hand. Why? Because we can see the future of taking those challenges, making ourselves better. How much more should we be doing those things spiritually? If you're a Christian this morning, you have a responsibility, a responsibility to God and to this church. Have you been making the most of the opportunities to act? Will you choose to serve God again? Do you have sin in your life that you need to repent of? Why not come forward this morning and repent of that sin? If we as members, members of the same body, do not know that you need help or that you are suffering, how are we supposed to come to your aid? We are in this together as different members of the same body. If you are not a Christian this morning, you have heard the word. Do you believe it? Do you believe in God, our Father? Do you believe in Jesus, His Son? Are you willing to repent of your sins, turn from this world, and confess that Jesus is the true Son of God? He is the true King. And be baptized for the remission of your sins. And here's the best part. We can come to God. We can come to Jesus just as I am, just as you are. Think about this. Rahab was a prostitute when she left the walls of Jericho. Ruth was a foreigner when she went back to Bethlehem. They had a responsibility, and they chose to act on the opportunity just as they were. They were insignificant, but they weren't insignificant to God. And neither are you. Why not choose to serve Him? Why not choose to serve Christ? Take this opportunity to commit your life to him. Consider consider your spiritual life this morning. And if you have a need, please come down to the front while we stand and while we sing this song.